Welcome back to Myth Represented, where we are addressing some of the stories behind Halloween, some of the misconceptions some people may have, some controversies, some little historical highlights and whatnot. I'm excited. We're doing a holiday episode. Yes, yeah, this, this uh, just hit us. Wow, this is a thing we can do, and we can do anything we want. Sometimes I, I forget that I'm not living under constraint of rules. And sometimes it's probably best that I think I do. So with Halloween, it's kind of just a lot thrown into a blender. So we're going to try and sort things out. Um, starting back as far as we can go and coming up to modern. Kind of like three episodes in one. Yeah, we're just going to kind of crunch it all together here. There's been a lot recently, well in the last couple of years, it's just a lot more information with Halloween being... More people know the past, more the history. It's not the as much just cook. People know the reason behind it, more so. As with any science, we're always learning new things about history, about um, the origins of our various social doings and traditions. So we're going to start way back to the Celts. They migrated between, you know, most of Europe, ending up in Ireland. And that's kind of where this takes place and starts off. You have their old ancient festival of Samhain. Now, again, what we know of Samhain is doesn't exactly come from, say, the Celts or the Druids, being their priests who would have done most of these ceremonies. It, they didn't write things down. They believed things were so sacred it could only be taught through story or passed down through word. Which is great and all, until like 2,000 years later when you would like people to kind of remember that stuff and nobody bothered to, you know, put it on a post-it or write it down in dear old Druid's journal. It's sort of, it's, it's a great idea to never write things down and think we should do this all by word of mouth, but anyone who knows word of mouth in one room between three people will screw stuff up. Yeah, and then I guess they didn't see the whole Roman invasion and Christianity thing coming and kind of wiping them out and uh, trying to get rid of them. Hindsight's twenty twenty. Yeah. So, unfortunately, the thing is, a lot of what we know about them comes from the Romans. Caesar, the problem is, um, if you're, say, the Romans, and you're trying to, you know, let's say, eradicate people get rid of them, take them over. Assimilate them like the Borg, as Romans do. Yes. You're probably not going to write the most accurate or nice things. If I'm going to go take over somebody or somebody I'm not fond of, I'm probably not going to be real honest in my writings about them. I'm probably going to call them every name in the book and say they murdered kittens and run over grandmas. And how much better off they are as Romans. Yeah. So that's kind of where we have to take some of the info we have with a grain of salt, going, is this actually accurate, or was this kind of a slander, or did the Romans kind of put a slant on this to make them look a little worse? Of course, with Halloween, you always hear the sacrifice this, animal sacrifice, human sacrifice. Again, there's not a whole ton of evidence. We have found mounds and things around certain areas in Ireland and Europe, where it does look like maybe somebody would have sacrificed. No one's really sure. Even from some of the burning wicker men, where, say, the Celts' enemies would be put into some sort of bonfire or even a figure made of wood. Along with Nicolas Cage. Uh, yeah. Oh, that movie. And burned alive. Now, some of them was, one of the stories of the Celts was, with this festival of Samhain, it was basically a New Year's celebration. But instead of watching the ball drop and hanging out in Times Square and watching Dick Clark, is he, yeah, he was probably around back then. Yeah. I think I'm so. I'm sure he was. So and we're going to say Hope. those Bob Hope and Dick Clark were around for the original Samhain. But part of their New Year's celebration, they believed they had basically two seasons. Instead of spring, summer, fall, winter, they had two. They... Again, this is a long time ago, when you didn't have the grocery store to go to, you didn't have all the amenities, so they didn't have time to waste with all these frivolous extra seasons. You basically had, you know, summer, which was, yay, I have food, and 
I'm alive. And then there was winter when, oh shit, we're out of food. I think I'm dead now. That was pretty much it. So you had some of the other festivals, um, a lot of modern day pagans celebrate with three fe harvest festivals, Lunasa, the fall equinox, and around Samhain, Halloween time. The first harvest being you kind of have the corn, the first of harvest, yay, we've got some food. Second harvest is usually your biggest, more bountiful. You have a lot of kind of Thanksgiving-like celebrations from different religions and cultures around the world. With around Halloween, that's your last chance. If you don't dig that damn food out of the ground now or get it off the freaking tree, you ain't going to have shit come wintertime. Now, that kind of fits with the whole, there was a uh, custom possibly that the Druids may have sacrificed a bull. Well, that sounds, you know, you hear the word sacrifice and people freak out and, you know, that's horrible, it's evil. Any of you eat meat, something was just sacrificed so you could eat it. It's not like these things were sacrificed and just left for nothing. They were used for food, whatever. And you have to consider, too, there's the whole, say you had four bulls, four cattle. Now you have to figure out a way to feed all four of them all winter long. Again, as we mentioned, food is scarce. And bulls don't provide milk. They're actually the less providing of the cows. Yeah. So you really only need, say, one to come spring, get with the cows and make more. Mm -hmm. But if you've got four you have to feed, you're now risking that if you don't have enough food, all four could get sick and die. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you, say, sacrifice slash kill and eat slash save, say maybe two of them, now that food that would have gone to those two can go to the two that are still alive. You're now ensuring, you're taking that gamble of way, well, yeah, we might end up with four cattle at the end of the year, or they could all die, or we could guarantee we're going to have at least two, and right here, right now, we can feast, fatten up for winter. So it's one of those kind of ways of looking at things. I want to address that with the whole vilification of sacrifice and what you said about if you eat meat, then an animal was sacrificed for your food. Pretty much every time in any sort of religion or mythology where I find sacrifices, it was almost always eaten. If anything, this is just your standard kill and eat an animal, only done with some reverence and sanctification. When people get angry about the sacrifice thing, it's really getting angry. It's saying, all you're really doing is getting mad that there is some respect being done instead of just industrial slaughterhouse that's detached that we don't have to look at. But really, ultimately, that's, that's one thing I'm always going to harp on people for is people would rather just not see it than it be done respectfully, which is uh, pretty evil in my eyes, actually. Yeah. Sorry anyone who thinks that way, but <laughs> if you think it's okay as long as I don't see it, that's that's called evil. Yeah. Anyway, back to the story. <laughs> but we, so along with the sacrificing the bull, whatever you want to call it, um, along with the, it's a New Year's celebration, to them, with the changing of their seasons, they believed as the f summer ended and winter started, there is a point where you're kind of outside of time. It's not summer, it's not winter yet. And they also believe that because of that, their spirit realm basically, you could say, touched the realm of mortals, the door to the spirit world opened. It was a lot easy for, easier for ancestors and spirits like the Fae, which would have been, say, fairies, goblins, bogarts, brownies, things like that that they believed in could much more easily access and come through to our world. And that's where a lot of traditions from, of Samhain stem from, as well as kind of the origins of some of the things we celebrate now with the ghosts and goblins and things. These Love that game. Oh, cool. oh, I'm thinking ghouls and goblins. Oh, uh, never mind. Firebrand. Yeah. So fun to play in Marvel vs. Capcom. But anyway, yeah, definitely check out the Ultimate Edition. It's worth it. Anywho basically when these thing doors open, you now have the chance that these spirits of ancestors or even slightly mischievous fae could come through. Let's clear this up. Are we talking demons? No. Are we talking devils? No. You have to remember, this was a time before 
the devil was around. I almost said invented, but I don't want to offend anybody, but oops, it slipped anyway. These th people didn't know what a devil or demons were. To them, these things weren't necessarily evil. Some were mischievous, yes. You have some goblins and some bogarts that might come through and tie your horse's hair in knots or knock over some cans of milk. It happens. So, little offerings would be left to appease these spirits. Little treats would be made, um, and on the other side, some of the more wanted spirits, like the ancestors, you would light little lanterns for them to find their way home. Something, again, you see, we'll mention, in multiple cultures around this time for this holiday. And then you have the wearing of masks, whether it was skulls or simple robes, that you could kind of wander this night and be one with the Fae or the spirits of the ancestors, that they would come pass by and look and go, oh, that's not a human, that's one of us. We won't tie your shoelaces together. So there's kind of two of our main traditions right there that, um, hey, we're still giving out the candy, the treats, and wearing some of the face masks and costumes, which have evolved from that. So some of the other things with Samhain, um, trying to figure out how old this was, some dates back to 2000 some years, there's actually not, there's complete evidence, but there's a mound of hostages on the Hill of Terra in the UK and it's aligned to the morning sun of Samhain. This dates back anywhere between four and a half thousand years ago to five thousand years ago. So that's actually before the Celts showed up. So this could have actually been some sort of seasonal change or something of celebrated by the people who lived there before and when the Celts got there it might have blended with their beliefs and turned into the Samhain that we know well, as much as we know of it. Um, There's always been a lot of that um, adaptation when, when people get to places, they find something. That's another reason why it's always so hard, because it's hard to date things. And we, do, we sometimes will gain theories, and then those theories will be accepted as fact before we actually are able to pin down a date and find the evidence and dig it up. Because you see those digs, they're going super slow. Yeah. Um, takes a while to actually figure out when things happen chronologically so I think that's where a lot of these myths come from like the whole controversy with somebody said hey wait a minute I think I really seriously think the Sphinx is older than the Egyptian Empire the biggest resistance he's got was people saying oh come on we've been saying this for too long we can't change it now not it's wrong it's just how could it be right when no one noticed it yet well sometimes that's how it works but yeah when I, when I first heard that you know like Stonehenge and stuff like that might be older than anything we know previously existed prehistoric literally a prehistoric something before any recorded people and when you have a lot of these ancient civilizations and I mean even today if you look at it every culture every country every civilization whatever you might want to call it kind of has a Borg syndrome where you're going to either destroy your neighbors or assimilate, mix and match, trade some customs back and forth. And that's all that this Halloween is. That's from the ancient roots up to now. It's just a mishmash of these cultures. Now, getting at some of the mythology behind Samhain, there was a rumor going around. I shouldn't say rumor. It was a, some misinformation. I guess it started back in the 90s that Samhain was a Celtic god of the dead. It's not true. Samhain translates basically to summer's end. So right there and then it kind of tells you that's a time. It's, it's telling you this holiday is this day. Um, the best they can find is that there may have been, there were stories of maybe a Celtic hero, um, not a god, that there were some stories about, and he was referred to as Samhain. They're figuring more that he was probably named after the holiday instead of vice versa. So, there is no Samhain god. Now, there are some stories that it does have some association with um, one of the Celtic gods, Baal. Some of the Baal fires that were lit, sacred fires, for the holiday, which a lot, basically the Celts lit giant bonfires for every damn holiday, which I'm okay with. I, we like bonfires even when there's not a holiday. 
Well, if you're going to stay up late in those times, a bonfire was very helpful. Yeah. And it's actually those hol- um, bale fires, the giant fires they lit, brings to us one of our kind of characters of Halloween that you decorate with, the bats. When you've got a giant bonfire, one of the only lights back then, back then the moths didn't have the fun street lights to flock to. So they'd go to the fires. Well, Lots, lots the, of light, lots of people to bite, yep. bugs everywhere. And those bugs are food for the bats. So now you're standing there around the fire. The, ba- the bugs are small. You don't happen to notice them. You just happen to see the flock of bats coming. So one little kind of character that you still see now, that's where it comes from. Now, we've got Samhain down. Celtic New Year celebration, some little ancestry worship, some little pain-in-the-ass fairies come out and try and wreck your day. That's that. Well then, time goes along, and as we mentioned, here come the Romans. Uh, We mentioned them in previous podcasts, the ultimate assimilators, where we're just going to take over, and we're not really going to think a whole lot. We're, we've already stole most of our gods and stories. Just change the names. Some very lazily, I may add. So when you had some of the Roman soldiers stationed around in Celtic territories, these peoples weren't always at each other's throat. You'd get to talking. And, you know, talk about the weather, the kids, whatever, and holidays. And up comes this holiday, Pomonia. Pomonia, the Feast of Pomonia. So, back to the mythology, Pomona was a Roman, um, they consider a goddess of harvest of apples. She was actually a wood nymph, and she wasn't so much the goddess of harvest, she was the goddess of actually watching the fruit ripen. She wasn't big on, like, actually keeping it for, like, a harvest party. She did, however, come with a hooked blade that she could remove her apples, but it was her job to guard these apples. Um, and nuts and different fruit trees, things like that. And her holiday was actually more in, I believe, mid-August. But again, some of the same harvesty-like traditions the Romans and Celts found in common, and they started to blend. So you have a lot of, again, what do you do at a Halloween party these days? Bob for apples. God, I did that at that club that one year. It's amazing I'm still alive. It was a public pool. It was just a big old Tupperware thing. Like, big crate full of water that I don't know how many other people stuck their heads There's in. so much head oil and spit. Oh! Well, you... and, and bits of makeup if you're doing the traditional costumes with makeup that we do around here. Ew, and I ate it! Oh, you... It's... If you knew what was in everything you ate throughout the day, it's inevitable that some unspeakable things end up in our food. And, uh, um, oh, I've noticed a good secret for bobbing for apples is get your lips on it and suck the apple in, and then bite down. You want to get some suction with your lips. That's how you get the apple. Nice. Don't try to use your teeth alone, you'll never get it. It's just a cesspool of human filth garnished with apples. <laughs> <laughs> so we have these traditions, now we've got a mix of them. Now, the thing is, there's not actually a lot of evidence. We don't really have a- any evidence of any Roman actually celebrating the Feast of Pomonia. There's, I believe, stories from Ovid that this took place. There's a legend or two of her. Um, she doesn't show up a lot. We're pretty sure she existed as a mythological figure. And... Her traditions kind of fit with Samhain. And that kind of mesh, and that's really the start of, all right, we may or may not have a pre-existing 5,000-year-old group already having some sort of Samhain party. Then the Celts come and make it Samhain, Samhain. Now you have Pomonia, the Romans, getting in on it. So that's kind of right there and then. Then, now we've got this good old Samhain whatever heart harvest holiday, you want to call it. Our more modern Halloween comes from really didn't take off until the potato famine. When a lot of the Irish settlers came to America, came to the United States, they brought this already mixed match tradition over. Now, you loosely have some, again, a lot of harvest traditions that the Native Americans had. 
not really anything in particular that you would really contribute to our modern Halloween. But again, this tradition kind of took off, and it kind of had this back and forth swing of so many years would be more of an adult kind of holiday. Well, then it would kind of go to the kids, and depending, you know, around World War II, World War I, or one and two, I'm doing that backwards. Depending on how much the money the economy had, you might not be spending it on treats, but that's kind of where the modern take got to. Now, it's not done evolving. It's not finished. You have Halloween. Now, to get Halloween, it, we had Sal and we had Pomonia. Where's Halloween, the word, come from? Well, with many things, the church got involved later after the Romans. And, of course, they weren't big on this. We've got a bunch of pagans running around worshipping ancestors, worshipping little people we can't see. We need to either demonize this or get rid of it. Well, they tried the whole demonizing thing. Didn't really work. These were traditions that the Celtic people, the Irish people, and people in that whole area kind of, for rightfully so, did not want to give up. So the church is finally like, fine, we've got... Saint, this would be Catholic Church. We've got basically every day there's a saint for. But there's only so many days in the year. And what do you know? We've got more saints. This is like Pokemon. It started out with a couple and then it just blew up. I don't know what level, like, saints, Saintamon, gold and silver packs now. I'm not sure. So they realized, well, crap. We've got more saints than we do days of the year, which is kind of terrifying when you think about it. So, how do you fight with that many pokey saints? I'd lose track. They would just be rotting in a pokeball somewhere in the back shelf. I really want there to be a version of Pokemon that's the saints. Would that be blasphemous and disrespectful? Oh my god, yeah! That would make it so much better. Still tempted. Still tempted. Blasphemon! <laughs> I choose you, Saint Francis, and he just starts throwing woodland creatures. <laughs> and they explode. <laughs> oh. Woodland creature attack. I want this game. St. Francis, Francis of Assisi uses stigmata. It's super effective. <laughs> so, we've got the church kind of freaking out now, going, well, shit, what do we do? Well, demonizing it didn't work, so I guess we're going to have to kind of assimilate this. So they decide they would have a night, All Souls Eve, where basically just you pray for all the souls. Um, these would be the souls stuck in purgatory. Because, you know, that's fun. So, All Souls Eve, you would pray to, and pray that they finally find their way and make their sorry asses to heaven. On, and that would be All Hallows Eve. Followed by All Saints Day, when you would pray to all the other saints that we ran out of days for. They put these, obviously, right around Samhain. To kind of get these beliefs, alright, that's fine what you believe, your pagan beliefs, but actually, instead of praying to your ancestors, or these you're praying about the departed saints. We'll let you kind of get away with praying to your ancestors, but it's going to be church-based now. So, All Hallows' Eve, people just got lazy, and it kind of shrank down, mixed up into All Hallows' Eve, into All Halloween, Halloween. And so, technically, you have some church influence, but basically they just kind of, like the Romans and the Greeks, copied what these Samhain and Pomona traditions already had. Um, and, again, one more kind of point of view, one more pantheon, one more system of belief blended into this holiday. Now, we have Halloween. Great. We've got Samhain, we got Pomona, we got the church kind of getting in on it. Thing is... I wasn't the only area of the world doing this stuff. You've got, um, I believe it's way beyond, the Hungry Ghost Festival. Happens a different time of year. Um, Asian countries, mainly China, where, same thing, it's the day of the year where ancestors come. I think it's like the second popular holiday next to Chinese New Year. Same thing, you leave out offerings, you leave out incense, and you pray or you even invite these ghosts these ancestors to your house like you legit set up your table leave the chairs empty you put food on the plates for them it's like they're there you just can't see them 
It's like when you're a little kid and you're determined that you're going to make that sandwich for your imaginary friend. But this is them actually believing that their ancestors, family members of ha that have passed, are coming and damn it, they want that seat. And not none of this fake food, not none of this pretend food, they want that sandwich on that damn plate. Possibly drinks. There's a lot of leaving alcohol too. But now there's... Halloween's really not finished yet. Or I should say finished evolving. Because now with it being mostly popular in North America, I mean it has traveled, it become more popular in other countries. You have the influence of South American countries, mainly Mexico, where you have Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead. This thing's kind of a whole other ball game on its own. This kind of goes back to ancient Aztec, where some say there was actually two whole months dedicated to uh, the passing of ancestors and the dead. Basically, you had one month of honoring the dead children, and the next followed by the dead of deceased adults. Some say it was more a two-day event, but again, right around the same time of the year. So, this kind of, you had, um, I, this is just awful me pronouncing, or pronouncing this, Meek Tekakahoodle? That is awful. What it is, is it's the goddess of the dead. And why I mention her is they had a few gods and goddesses of the dead. She kind of, again, did this evolving. You took this ancient tradition, this honoring the dead. Well, next thing you know, here come the Spanish. And here comes Christianity. So they get here and they're going, ah, oh, crap, here we go again. A bunch of people running around, worshipping the dead, slash honoring their ancestors. So, same thing, try and demonize, doesn't always work. So we're going, all right, fine. Here's our All Saints Day, here's our traditions. Why don't you kind of celebrate that more than your gods? They actually turned a lot of their gods into saints, which is the church has done before. And this turned into this crazy festival where a lot of culture, I shouldn't say a lot of cultures, it's basically our culture, uh, Christian ish, where because of the church not wanting people to worship the ancestors, you don't, you want them to be worshiping Jesus, you want them to be worshiping God. Where these cultures that weren't necessarily influenced much by Christianity have more of a, it's not this death is bad, it's not death is scary, it's not something to be feared, it's you're not necessarily, you're not celebrating death, you're celebrating those you lost. You're remembering them. And you see this in with the Day of the Dead. It's not this dark and dreary, scary, ominous holiday. It's freaking neon everywhere. Glitter, fireworks, sparkles, candies. It, it's, and also with the kids. In our culture, you kind of lean away from death. We're having that talk about death. Dog dies, he ran away. Grandma dies, she ran away too with the dog. They, they all went to that nice farm upstate. Oh, yeah. It's full of grandmas and dogs. <laughs> it's, it's always hard when someone's like, I want to go to that nice farm that's filled with grandmas and dogs. And then you're like, oh, next yeah. week. We'll do it next <laughs> week. So that, it's an interesting look culturally that this is, you see, so, you see children literally sitting on tombstones, singing songs, ha eating candies. You see these graveyards decorated like you would say Christmas lights of every color people dressed up now you do see the image of death of skulls again this is something that kind of came from the more ancient Aztec where obviously skulls are a symbol of death and this death goddess that I mentioned she continues to evolve and basically comes La Katrina which was a more of a political cartoon, um, I believe 1910, from Joseph Jose Guadalupe Posada, where he basically was kind of showing her, it was a skeletal female with this big lavish hat, like Crazy Hat Society, and basically showing no matter how rich you are, you're still the same as the poor. Rich, poor, you're all gonna die. And that was kind of the message behind this cartoon, but it kind of became a new symbol. Like, you've got the Easter Bunny for Easter, you've got Santa Claus for this, 
he got some half dead lady in a big freaking hat going around and children just love it who doesn't want to take candy from a zombie in a big hat I certainly want to so with I mean a lot of immigration coming a lot of Mexican Americans and just Latin Americans in America a little redundant um, you're seeing a lot of these Day of the Dead celebrations uh, they're big in California and some of the southern states but it's kind of the new cool thing even in here we are in Pennsylvania, a little farther north. You can go to so much as the dollar store, the Rite Aid, the Walgreens down the street, and see the painted skulls for Day of the Dead. These overly colorful imagery, which is nice in comparison to we usually just got. Here's a pack of spiders. Here's a black cape. Here's some black candles. It's a little depressing when you have to remember that almost all the customs that melted together to make this Halloween death was again death itself not celebrated but the idea of these ancestors you don't want to forget them you're inviting them back you're here to celebrate their life so i see a lot of that kind of getting brought back trying to take the celebration back versus just this you know scary and what has become in our country good that it's just nothing but darkness gore slasher flick after slasher flick after freaking well, slasher flick. glorification of death as opposed to celebration of life and acceptance of death was the original intention. You're around here for Halloween, you go to these overpriced um, places where I believe they have haunted houses, but you spend four hours in line and then 20 minutes in some haunted house, which is just filled with bloody things and people with knives and creepy clowns. Again, not what any of these people who can, cultures who contributed to this holiday would understand, but that's kind of what happened. We went with, you know, the church making it this thing that was bad, this thing that was dark, this ominous evil, and guess what? That sold. That sold in merchandising, that sold in movies, and toys, and into the costumes, and we bought into it as this is the scary, this is the murderous, this is the evil time of the year. It's that sort of lore of the forbidden. And of all holidays, this is the one that is going to appear to fans of horror movies and the macabre. So I think that's a lot of that. That tended to get emphasized a lot because that's what people wanted. And, and so much of modern Halloween practices are all about marketing. They're about what sells. And I'm, I've always been a fan of of spooky things of the diehard Vincent Price fan as a child um, watched many a horror flick and I, I can definitely see how that evolution occurred but it, it it's not really as much as inextricably linked to the traditions as people would think it was never originally intended to be a horror fest we just kind of made it that way and one, um, one thing I do want to note about the haunted houses, it, it's also, you see it here in a very poignant way, how this holiday, because people who are drawn to the macabre, there's also some unsavory individuals drawn to Halloween. If there are disturbed individuals or individuals into dark occult things, they will do things on Halloween to further vilify the holiday, to further associate it. People will do crazy things. And unfortunately for actors in those haunted houses, these people go to those haunted houses and they seem to get it in their head that this is the place where it's okay to punch people. And people, um, some people unintentionally, but there are people who who go in there to abuse the actors. So I just want to say real quick, um, fuck you people. Y'all can burn in a fire. We'll, we'll sacrifice you if anything's going to be sacrificed this holiday. Yay, for the make, good of the tribe! Make the world a better place by sacrificing a, uh, a bull who's just eating food. Because that's what you people are who beat other people. As a person who's been beaten, I must say, not into them. In researching this, again, this whole Halloween thing, I, like Ron has mentioned, just the history of Halloween in the States is just filled with people saw this as a night of mischief and it went from slight pranks that the fae might go to burning down an entire row home like in the crow 
Hell Knight. Oh. Yeah. That's what happened in The Crow. It, it devolved to the point where it was a night of vandalism. And there was, it was the point, I mean, you hear this stories of, you know, people putting razor blades and apples and poisoning kids' candies. I mean, yes, still, check your kids' candy. Be safe on this night. Because, unfortunately, there are idiots out there, to, there who ruin things. But, again, you've got just as many creepy Santas out there murdering and who knows what. There's always, there's always a little truth to it. Um, oh, uh, the, that was one thing I wanted to address is the, the poisoning of candy. Just a little uh, reassurance. It's not as common as people would have you think. That is a big, a big hype thing. Now, there have been cases of people poisoning things. There have been cases of poison. There was, um, when I was younger, I remember some cyanide-laced grapes were found in a supermarket. But it, to successfully poison something like that, it's really hard to get a lot of poison into a person. You really have to plant it. The amount of grapes they calculated you would have to eat to get sick off the cyanide, you would actually rupture your stomach and die. I could do it. You would be killed by the grapes long before the cyanide would kill you. But for the most part, um, sabotaged Halloween candy is not as common as people would think. So you're you're once again way more likely to be hit by a car on Halloween than to get poison candy. And I mean by hundreds of times more likely. Um, Which there's a little public service announcement. Please be safe on Halloween. Just bright, stay in well-lit areas. Don't let your kids wander off. Um, don't take candy from anybody in a white van. Um, I guess the... And, uh, yeah, if you are going to... A lot of costumes do are all black, so carry glow sticks. They have battery-powered glow sticks now. They look like tiny lightsabers, and you should probably own five of them anyway, even if you're not going to use them but once a year. I was just thinking all those little black ninjas and Darth Vader's better have their lightsabers out or you gonna get rogue. Oh yes, by the way, another good reason to dress as a Sith or Jedi, you have a giant glow stick with you that your kid's gonna be waving around. So, by all means, safest costume ever, so I'd like to see a couple hundred more Vaders and Lukes out there. Now I know you've had some interest in some of the modern treats, the modern things for Halloween. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about about where you've talked a lot here about where it's come from I like I, I have a lot of interest in where it has ended up Halloween where are they now well um well there's a lot of controversy always been a lot of controversy about Halloween as you said it, it is a very dark and morbid time at least it's grown into that and as I was saying earlier it's there's a lot of unsavory individuals drawn to it and that tends to get emphasized this is very much, um, you see this in the media a lot, a lot of panics. And panics sell. Panics are where the media makes their money. So you're always going to hear about the worst. They, it's like we were told, we want dirty laundry. And that's what we see on the news. Yeah, now that song's stuck in your I head. I currently am dancing along to the Don Henley in my head. Don Henley rocks. Anyway, that's really the purpose of this podcast. Sorry, ulterior motive, promoting Don Henley. <laughs> but um, the whole thing with costumes, this is what, when people think Halloween, costumes are one of the primary things. A lot of holidays in Europe used costumes. As, as I've researched ancient histories and read up on different cultures, I see so many people in costumes, especially during harvest time all throughout Europe, I cannot tell what any of these costumes are supposed to be. They're mostly just giant wicker suits, odd fur. There's one that looks like kind of like a characterized Chewbacca. I keep seeing a recurring theme. God. It's, it's this weird hair suit. Uh, I'll have to pull up a picture then and show you. It's amazing. I've seen a lot of them where it is just a lot of hides, skulls, yeah, bits and pieces. Yeah, just that's what they had to work with. Yeah, and th this the costume thing, dressing up as something to gain its power or to hide from it has always been in cultures. You see so many ritualistic and sacred costumes and masks. All throughout Africa you see masks of gods hanging everywhere. This was has always been, I think, a very primal, along with music and dance, it's a very primal human thing to want to dress up, to oh, yeah. become something else. It's, it's our one true chance at metamorphosis. You even have a lot of, in some of the Native Americans, the skinwalkers, where they wear the skin of a wolf, a bear, and become 
spiritually that animal. You even have, the, we'll mention later on, it, when we get to the Norse, the berserkers. Mm -hmm. Translates to bear shirts. It puts a bear skin on, and next thing you know, you're a damn juggernaut running through an army. Exactly. So that's, that's where the costumes come from. And it, it would tend to be, like you were saying earlier, that you have, you dress up as the fae, you dress up as these creatures. And it, it, I guess it sort of was marketing. It was people said, oh, hey, we can get them to dress up as our trademark character, we can make money off of this merchandise. And once again, you'll see a lot of Halloween has come down to marketing. Which brings me to the next huge iconic thing of Halloween, and that's the candy. We sell so much, so much candy just on Halloween alone that it's always going to be a lucrative thing. It's always going to be something they're going to do. I um, Let's look at the least loved candy. The one that people have petitioned to have destroyed. Candy corn. Oh, that's just um, nasty. I like it. I'll, I'm I'll... sorry. I don't like a lot of it. I will eat a few pieces. I get sick of it real fast. But I don't, I don't really uh, see I it as too bad. I mean, I, I, I want to like it. It's a Halloween thing. I love all things Halloween. I want to really like it, and I try. One piece every year, I really do. And then I probably spit it out and just go lick the sidewalk because it tastes better. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really not the most inspired of candy, but a lot of early and traditional Halloween candy, you had this extruder-based candy, Tootsie Rolls. You just pump out a rope of those and chop, 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 and then wrap it in a twist paper. Or in the case of candy corn, you spit it out of an extruder, and this is a cheap mass produ produced candy lollipops all these homogenized types of candies unless you go to a good house where you get like fun size snicker or oh my goodness full size snickers you know people hand those out find those houses but a lot of these simple candies were so easily marketed and it is just amazing the amount we sell on Halloween and you can really see how marketing has promoted that handing out candy thing um so candy corn, one of the least loved, it doesn't even get individually wrapped. It's The people who make it don't even respect it enough. So we, it's estimated we sell 90 billion pounds, about 40 metric tons. I'm not sure how close that comes to a metric fuck ton, but probably pretty damn close. 90 billion pounds of candy corn that's every a year. a whole lot of nasty. And you know most of that's going to be sold on Halloween. And it was invented in Philadelphia, so local to here, just down the road, just down the highway. That's where candy corn came from. Once again, uh, things that come out of Philly, loved by, loved fervently by a few and hated by the most. I somehow just found a picture online that you can actually stack it to make a corn cob. This blew my mind. I'm going to be trying this. This uh, may be something we have to post. I think that was posted by people who wanted to save the love of candy corn. I'll play with it, but I won't eat it. And it'll oh, probably fine. make me furious, because trying to stack this... I just... I picture... It, it, consider it martial arts training. This this is part of your kung fu training. You must stack the candy corn. Will I become oh. Iron Fist? Probably. All right. And, oh, um, it was... An alternate name for candy corn, chicken feed. Shit nuggets. Or Ch that. Chicken feed. It's it's also called chicken feed. So there's another iconic piece, and that brings to me to my third big icon, and that's big icons. A lot of the symbols of Halloween, you were saying with the bats, they flew around um, skeletons because there's a lot of celebration of the dead, of course, especially with the skeleton has always been iconic in the Central American celebrations. There are some other icons with origins. The witch is a huge thing in the season of the witch. You hear that? You're going to hear that song a couple hundred times around this time of year. Um, the image of the witch, the green skin, the pointed hat with the buckle on it, the long nose with the wart, this image is very specific. You always see witches depicted in that stereotypical form, riding on a broom with a black cat. There is a lot in this image, and there's a lot why it is that, why that exact specific image. Now, back in the day when 
people were being burned at the stake and whatnot. They were trying to get rid of certain religions and promote Christianity as the head one religion. Now, one big way to do this is propaganda. Um, interesting little bit here. Heathen, which is a word to use to describe in a derogatory sense non-Christians, and pagan are specifically directed, their word origin comes from people of the country. These were people who still worshipped. They weren't in the city, they weren't worshipping the new modern god. They were worshipping the old gods. And heathen literally is people of the heath. It's, it's country folk. Heathen means country folk. So, this was this backwards, outdated religion. And people wanted to make it look ridiculous. They wanted to say, oh, look how silly and goofy and stupid this religion is. That hat, that pointed hat with the buckle on it and all that, was fashionable at one time. But at the time, they were really trying to vilify and make uh, propaganda regarding the silliness and backwardsness of these old religions. They always depicted the worshipper as wearing an outdated hat because it was an outdated religion. And anyone who wears a hat that was stylish a couple years ago is just behind the times and backwards. The long pointed nose, the wart, and the green skin was to further debase this image. Look how ridiculous and ugly, and it's just, why would you want to follow this religion? It was, it was kind of in a sense of a character, a negative character of the worshipper of the old religion. Rotting on the broom came from um, a ritual of brooms were sometimes used in rituals, and also this was I know it's still used, a lot of women's rights groups will say that this was a liberation of the woman using the broom, which was a symbol of a household worker as a symbol of power. I'm not a hundred percent the validity of that, but it does seem it does seem a viable idea that the symbol of the housekeeper was being used as a symbol of power. So people hopped up on poppy seeds may have looked at that and seen, oh, they're flying around on these brooms because they came up with some weird shit when they were paranoid and eating poppy seeds. I don't know if that poppy seeds thing is true. I'm gonna have to check the validity of that now. That that just popped into my head. Uh, and uh, the cats were familiar spirits. You would have a spirit you would contact to gain your power as a witch. And that's why they were always depicted as cats. Sometimes frogs, snakes, and whatnot. But cats were always around civilized areas. So that became the big symbol. And that's also you see the black cat. People, people get scared by cats. They are a little weird, I'll admit. And... At this point now, you have the skeletons, the bats, the witch, and it's just natural for people to then add, you know, the MGM movie monsters, the vampire, the mummy, ghosts. Oh, that's another thing because of the spirits of the dead. Ghosts were always a big thing. And eventually, once again, marketing kicked in, and now that we had these iconic characters for Halloween... Now people are like, well, let's throw our trademark character in, and just like with the costumes, now we see many, many things. We see Elsa's and Buzz Lightyear's and all that, <laughs> because someone's got to make money off of it. And as with any major, major holiday, it's going to get marketed like crazy. But still, even though there's a lot of cutesy aspects added to it, Halloween has always had a lot of controversy around it, and people have sought to boycott it or get it boycotted people boycott it all the time people want it in some places even want to get it banned I don't know um, that might just be a select few very likely just a select few but a lot of people really don't like this holiday because it's very different from their own beliefs and there's always going to be that fear and that desire to squelch anything that may oppose or take away glory from one's own beliefs. But for the most part, I think a lot of the controversy is just a, a select few who are speaking the loudest and not necessarily representing 
the opinion of the many. I think we're always going to have Halloween. There is a lot of religious people have done trick or treating for UNICEF. I'm back in my day. That was what people did. I don't really know if anyone does that anymore, but there were kids from religious families would go around and collect charity on Halloween. They would actually go around with boxes. They would just dress up in their Sunday best, and they would go around instead of collecting candy, collect you know coins. You collect quarters for UNICEF for charity. And then they would gather that money up, and they would send it to the poor and help. Which, you know, if if you're going to be a religious individual, collecting money for charity is always a good way to go. That's definitely the the good side of of a fervent following of one's beliefs, and not trying to ban other people's celebrations. The thing it comes down to, if you'd spend the time and actually do a little bit of research. Every tradition that ended up mixing together to form the Halloween we know, there was nothing evil. It was a celebration. It was remembering those who have passed, not what later cultures, what religious groups have made it out to be. Again, once it hit the States, yes, I I myself sometimes have problems with some of the gory imagery, the more disturbing stuff you see. That wasn't really there from any culture or religion. That was just something, again, like we talked about it, just to that scare value just to get that extra marketing and that wouldn't even be there if it wasn't demonized or looked down upon by the church previously it's it's really is a modern recent addition the the gore fest is it's it's another it's another culture getting in on it the culture of horror movies there there are horror movie buffs and it's it's really it, it, it's, it's one of those, those holidays that has become a set of holidays that have become sewn together. It's a patchwork holiday. It's kind of a Frankenstein. Ah! Yet another big icon. So, any, do we have anything else to... I think that pretty much wraps up Halloween. Alright, so go out there, be safe, dress as a Jedi... Eat some candy corn. Just eat it! Oh, why not? I want to play with it. Whatever. And um, have a safe and happy Halloween. And respect others. We will see you next time on Myth Represented. Our next episode, we will be diving back into our pantheons. Up next, the Norse. I will have a sledgehammer with me for the entire podcast. I have a Thor shirt with a detachable cape, helmet, and a Nerf me all near. All right. I am so excited. Uh, We we should uh, drink mead, too. Yes? That's what we're spending our budget on that time. Yay! Mead. Bye-bye.